Brady. I'm the owner educator at Our Mammies. I started Our Mammies, which is a history and genealogy program, in 2013. It came out of my love of genealogy and family history, and of course, Louisiana. I wanted to teach kids how to find like the heroes on their family trees, and so it started just growing from there. And one of the things I noticed very early on, I wanted to like grab attention to get the conversation going, and I felt that if I'm going to talk about my ancestors, I want to wear some of the clothing that they would have worn at that time to try to like add a layer to the story. I work with children and adults. Favorite thing to, uh, to tell the kids, guys, the back of the plantation was jumping, and it was like, you mean? I was like. Do you realize what was going on back there after all of that work? They were trading secrets, sharing stories, creating music, creating the culture and traditions that we love today. It was a party back there. I know it. I feel it in my heart that at the end of the day, after everything that they've experienced, those families came together and they supported each other. I have been doing adult genealogy classes that I've been teaching through the public library system, cemetery preservation project in New Orleans, and then I do, I've been doing summer camps in addition to my day job. I do all of these things as long as it aligns with remembering and honoring my ancestors, I'm going to do it. We have the power to, sh to change the narrative, to shift like the way of the world, and I consider that to be like very powerful. So when I first started Our Mammies, I had this little uh, binder in front of me and I with the thing of naming the persons who I would portray and this is before I knew as much information as I know now I literally named my grandmothers without even knowing them so for example my Francois line I wrote in this very first um, binder that I would portray this Francois lady who was very strong and um, very powerful. On my binder, I called her Adelaide Francois, and I actually have a grandma that was called Adelaide Francois, and before I even knew she existed. How can I have memories of someone that I've never met? And so I started looking into it and see that there's this thing called ancestral memories that we carry our ancestors' uh, memories within in our, in our DNA. So maybe that's where her name came from. So right after I had Benjamin, I went through a really bad postpartum depression. I wouldn't come out of the room. I wouldn't really talk to anyone. I wasn't really eating. My husband, he knows how much I love all of these powerful women that come before me. So he put me in a car. So we went to St. Francisville. I went to the historical society there. I saw the museums and I saw like all the spaces where my ancestors walked. I walked on the ground. That's said, okay, I feel better. So I went back to work. And then a couple of years later, I ended up getting very sick and I lost hearing on the left side. A lot of people don't know I'm supposed to wear a hearing aid. My husband did the thing again. He put me in a car. We drove to St. Francisville. I'm still sad. I'm pouting all the way there. And so I got out the car, you guys. I put one foot on the ground. I could hear a voice in my deaf ear that literally said, it's going to be okay. I didn't get out the car at all. I had one foot out. I got back in the car, closed the door. I said, okay, I'm fine. Let's go. And I was fine. My husband was like, what happened? I said, I heard Grandma Lizzie, and she told me I was going to be okay. Now, the cool thing about Grandma Lizzie is Grandma Lizzie was a midwife. She lived in St. Francisville, and I knew it was her voice. Our mammies is important to me, and pardon me if I get emotional, but I always find no matter what program I'm doing, there's always going to be a reminder in some kind of way from one of my ancestors, like almost like a head nod, like a blessing that, yes, this is what I want you'd be doing at this moment. So Mama Belle is actually one of my favorite ancestors. She's like my hero. The reason why is Mama Belle started her family very early and um, she got married very young and she raised multiple generations there after her. She was born in 1888, died in 1971. She was a domestic servant. She traveled from Clinton to Des Almonds, back to New Orleans. She worked to provide for her family even after her husband was injured. I feel like if I didn't tell Mama Belle's story, then no one will remember what she accomplished. No one will remember what she contributed to society. And then, of course, there's like tons and tons of stories on like free people of color and this, that, and the other. I just wanted to tell like who are those people in the background? Like what were their lives like? Like the ordinary people, the regular folks. And genealogy does that. And so my way of dealing with finding a creative way to tell this story, to make it hands-on and make it interactive and make you appreciate all of your ancestors, no matter what they've accomplished or didn't accomplish. Our mammoth is a tool to do that, so that's why I did it. 
And then I'll confess, like when I first started doing this, people were hung up on the name. They were hung up on like, why would any African-American woman want to portray an enslaved person or portray anything that, that happened in the 1718 and 1900s? Like, what's the matter with you? How like when we hear certain terms, it really just like, it's a trigger, right? But I felt that I had to take that stereotype and show the world who Mama Bell was. Because they both served in the same capacity. But this this stereotype of like who Mammy is or was, was not the women who raised me. By no means were these women uneducated. By no means were these women the, the person or the character portrayed. So I was like, give me this word and I'm going to give you the new meaning. And that's how I was born. So I wanted to create a new meaning for a word, for a powerful person in the African-American community. Like, and I tell people this, I said, you think of it this way, you know, for African-American families, when mama dies, everything falls apart. Um, it, when, when grandma dies, the entire family falls apart. So that shows you right there how powerful, how important that person is to the community. So I had to do something to highlight her using that term that everybody was familiar with, that the majority of African-American women is Mama Bell. Mama Bell, uh, born August 28, 1888. She died here in New Orleans um, in April 1971. She was born in Clinton, Louisiana. Um, that side of my family were all pretty much domestic servants, um, and the men in the family worked on sawmills. So they left Clinton, Louisiana, and they went to De Salmons to work on Bowie Sawmill. And that's where our family church was established. The building is still standing in uptown New Orleans. My dad's side, different story. Um, my grandfather went away um, for World War II. And uh, he came back with a different perspective on life. And he just said, here's what I'm not going to do today. And the plantation owner told him, if you're not gone by the time morning rises, we're going to kill you. So um, they left. In fact, they left the plantation when my grandmother was pregnant with my dad. So that's not that long ago. That's the scary part. Like when people say things, they don't realize that I'm literally one generation out. I heard many stories about my belle. I saw photos of her, but I didn't quite understand her life. She's like, our own little queen and I couldn't understand like god everybody has a photo of this woman in their house but I didn't know anything about her and learning I understood why just um her kids my grandma Florence who I'm dressed like now she's actually my great grandma when they came to New Orleans they all joined unions they opened up a church up in uptown New Orleans that's when our families first started getting access to formal education when we arrived in New Orleans so that's the mood I kind of like wanted to portray today and just like how we left the plantation and we went on to bigger things in the city and then we left some behind but we never forgot it we took the traditions with us we took the food with us we took family practices with us my mom's side of the family very close-knit they all pretty much live in the neighborhood where we are right now this is like a little island everybody knew everybody everybody was almost married to everybody over here similar to plantation life this is home and it has been home i think three four hundred years away when I stand on this land, I tell people it feels very peaceful because this, in my mind, is freedom seeker lands. When people were running away from the plantation, this is the swamps and the bayous and all these places where they would hang out and find peace. This is where like gatherings were taking place. Even though the history wasn't written down, it was still passed to us verbally. They weren't known necessarily as grandma, it was Mama Belle, Mama Florence. The funny thing about every single one of my costumes is named after one of my grandmothers because I want to keep them near me and I want to, when I put that dress on, I want to do my best to be their voice um, and say what they wanted to say but couldn't. And I do this little ritual um, before every program, every meeting, no matter how I'm engaging with the community, I ask their permission to share their stories. Again, because I want to be like those women. Like a lot of people may say, well, yeah, but they were uneducated and they were this and they were that. But to me, I was like, no, it's not education in the way that you may think of it. But these women were healing people with food and encouraging people and educating in their own way. And I want to have that skill set. I do my best to make sure every day I'm telling their story in one way or the other, or just remembering them or just researching their lives. 
So, like, for example, um, growing up, I used to suffer with really bad nosebleeds, right? Like, horrible nosebleeds. And my dad told my mom to put a brass key around my neck with a black string. And the nosebleeds would stop. And I would have to wear it every day in order for that to happen. Now, scientifically, I'm sure that there's a reason why the nosebleeds stop. But I wore that key from about kindergarten all the way to about seventh grade. And I didn't have to wear it anymore. Um, the nosebleed stops and then also um, I would always like catch these horrible horrible colds and that's when the, the the tea would come about right like if you drink this tea it's gonna all come up Rub a little bit of whiskey on the baby's gums to stop the toothache and all little stuff like that but it works right like using the tools that you have to survive and that's the piece that I've learned just how to survive with limited resources one of the things um, I actually learned um, from a family member, then I heard it again when I was in Donaldsonville, I, I had really bad uh, rheumatoid arthritis for a long time, and I was in a ton of pain. And I remember them saying, you need to find you some pepper, baby, some pepper. You need some pepper, like hot peppers. Eat hot peppers, and it's going to reduce the inflammation. Really? I tried it. It worked, right? I don't have to take medication for rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, of all of the autoimmune diseases and stuff I had, I don't take any medication. I, I'm not saying I'm not pain-free, but I don't have to take any medication. And then on the line of peppers, um, we were always taught to plant hot peppers in the front of your yard to keep the evil spirits away. Even with cleaning practices, um, my dad would tell you, you can't clean the house from the front to the back. You always start in the back, and they clean from the back to the front. And after you're done, sprinkle the whole house with Florida water. So, but little practices like that, little things like that, we were just taught by words and then also by practices. I often too have dreams of things and places um, and it'll put me like way in the past as if I was there living through it. And then um, sometimes when I'm researching, I realize like, holy cow, my ancestors were there. So I looked out at this gate and I remember um, several times I wake my husband up and said, man, I had this dream that I was talking to. I was trying to get to this little lady. She was sitting on the porch and she was talking to people. And, and I was waiting in line to try to talk to her. But, you know, I was rushing to try to get to the front, but I couldn't get to her. And when I looked out and saw the van out there just now, and then I, and I was sitting here in this chair, and it made me realize maybe I was the little lady. Because this was like literally my vision. Um, and it just, I just saw it.